Hello, I'd like to welcome everyone that's joined us for the Northeast Region Regional Advisory Council meeting for December 10th, 2020. And before we start the meeting, I need to read a, a brief statement. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic and the ability of the virus to spread from person to person, the governor has implemented a number of executive orders directed at controlling the spread of the virus by minimizing face-to-face -face interactions. Public gatherings are strongly discouraged by the CDC, State of Utah, and local health departments since they facilitate face-to-face -face contact and pose an elevated risk for virus transmission. The Division of Wildlife Resources and the chair of this public body have determined that public gathering at the Regional Advisory Council and Wildlife Board meetings presents a substantial risk to the health and safety of those who attend and we'll conduct this meeting using the fully electronic format. This meeting format is authorized by recent amendment to the Utah Code and executive order by Utah Governor Gary Herbert, and will be temporarily used in place of the person-to-person -person meetings that usually occur. Anyone wishing to comment on agenda topics in future meetings or to observe this meeting may do so by logging on to the division's web page where instructions and links are provided. Thank you. I'm Brett Prevedel. I'm the chairperson of the Northeast RAC, and I would like to take a moment and let the other RAC members that are in attendance introduce themselves and who they represent. I'll go ahead and start. Good evening. I am Dan Abeda, and I represent the Ashley National Forest. Joe Arnold, I represent the public. Brad Horrocks, I represent sportsmen. Rebecca Jones, and I represent one of the users. <clears throat> Natasha, could you introduce yourself again? The audio did not come through. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's clear now. Okay. All right, uh, I'm Natasha Haddon, and I represent the Bureau of Land Management. Thank you. I'd also like to rec recognize Randy Durth, who's in attendance. He's a member of the Wildlife Board, and I would like to thank the Division of Wildlife individuals who are who have joined us tonight. With that, um, I will start with a with a asking for a motion to approve tonight's agenda. Yeah, this is Dan Abeda, and I would make a motion that we approve tonight's agenda. This is Brad Horrocks, and I'd make the motion. We se I second that. Okay. Roll call on that. Brad? Aye. Joe? Aye. Dan Abeda? Yes. Natasha? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Thank you. Now I would attain. Uh, I, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting, or recommend any changes to them. Uh, this is Natasha Haddon, and I would like to make a motion to accept the minutes from last meeting. Do we have a second? This is Joe Arnold. I will second. Thank you. Joe Arnold, I will second that. Roll call. Brad? Yes. Joe? Yes. Dan? Yes. Natasha? Yes. And Rebecca? Yes. Thank you. Um, now I will give a, I'll try to be brief, but it won't be very brief because we had a seven hour wildlife board meeting last week. Um, I'll give you an update of the motions. And what I'd like to do is is go through the the motions and then entertain questions for myself, for Randy Durth, or for div division personnel after I go through the motions, rather than go back and forth on these topics. If that's okay with the group, is that acceptable? 
Yes. All right. Yeah. Um, the the first thing on the agenda was the the blinds out on the the Willard Spur, and there was quite a bit of this. I think all the racks, all the racks were in favor of not having any new blinds. There was quite a bit of discussion about what to do with the existing blinds and whether they should be maintained or or not maintained, and who owned them and whether there was going to be conflict. Same discussions we had. Um, so in the end, the wildlife board um, approved unanimously that they that they allow the existing 20 blinds for 10 more years, and then they'd be phased out or removed at the end of the 10 years. Then the um, big game season changes. Uh, Key dates and that there was um, there was one motion made to there was an overlap on the on the bighorn sheep hunts down in Pine Valley and Virgin River and Pine Valley Beaver Dam. They overlapped the general season deer hunt, and so there was a motion made to shorten the sheep hunts, which were their long hunt, six or seven weeks, if I remember to take the first days, seven days off of the sheep hunt and started a week later. So it did not have, have um, conflict with the, with the deer hunt. Um, there was quite a bit of discussion on that because um, Dan, similar to our discussion we had yesterday, this just came up at the, at the wildlife board meeting and it was not discussed in either the southern rack or any of the other racks. So we can talk about that after I go through these, but um, it was um, the, the, the motion was to remove seven days at the start of the season. And, and I believe it, it it failed four to two. So I believe the, the season stayed the same. That's what the summary of motion says. Um, then this, the issue of the spike elk hunt came up in the book cliffs. Um, it was discussed with the division personnel at length. And if you remember, um, the rack had, our rack had passed a suggestion that we eliminate the spike elk hunt in the book cliffs. And the decision that came out of the wildlife board unanimously was to reduce this, the length of the season to five days. And there was a, another date change on the, on the New Harmony extended archery deer dates to shorten the back end of the season. And that passed unanimously. Um, the, dis the discussion about the age class on the book cliffs, which if you remember our rack recommended that we leave it at seven and a half to eight and not reduce it to six and a half to seven, which was proposed by the division. Um, there was a motion to leave it at the seven and a half to eight and that passed unanimously. Um, there was also another one on the Central Mountains Nebo to leave it at its current current age class, which is six and a half to seven, and and it failed. Then there was um, a motion to accept new limited entry hunts on the Cache North, Oker Stansbury Plateau, Oker Stansbury West, Plateau Barney Top, Kaparowitz, West Desert Deep Creek, and Box Elder Pipeline Mountains, and that, that that's the new limited entry hunts, and that passed unanimously. Um, then we had a, a long discussion of the nine mile anthro unit that we discussed at length in the rack. Um, you know, our system is has got some good good points and some bad points, I guess. And and this this online online format, obviously doesn't allow for a lot of dialogue in person. 
And so what happened there is, if you remember, we we recommended unanimously as a rack to leave Nine Mile Anthro as a limited entry unit. Um, the division did not agree with us and they went to the wildlife board and asked the wildlife board to go with their recommendation, which was to eliminate the limited entry on Nine Mile and include it in the general bull unit. So that's what I'm kind of referring to. Maybe it wasn't the best situation because the wildlife board basically got two recommendations that were as far extreme as they could get and they had to make a decision. Um, and they all said they didn't, they'd never been on the unit. So it was, it was not an ideal situation and it ended up being a tie vote and, um, Chairman Bateman broke the tie and, and, um, decided to leave the nine mile as a as a limited entry unit but then there was uh, some discussion and another motion made or part of the same motion kind of lost track exactly how it happened but there was a compromise made by the wildlife board and what that is is to turn the nine mile anthro into a handgun archery muzzle loader shotgun primitive weapons hunt so that was the final final decision and we can discuss this in a moment you know I'll, I'll open it up but um that was there um i know that wasn't discussed at any of the racks but they were in a tough spot and everybody's given them varying opinions of whether it was a worth a really poor unit or a really good unit and they attempted to compromise and you know personally i i think they come up with a pretty good compromise. Um, I'm sure other people have a different opinion, but that's my opinion. Um, so then there was the, uh, the other um, limited entry units and um, that passed. The, they, they discontinued the current limited entry hunts on Cache, North, Oker, Stansbury, and West Desert, Deep Creek. That passed for the five to one. Then there was a motion that they changed the um, Box Elder Sawtooth, Oker, Stansbury, East, Southwest Desert, North to another to a Hams hunt also, and that passed four to two. And then there were some boundary changes that that we had supported that went through without any, much discussion. Then we got to the discussion on the um, general season bull elk. And if you remember all the other racks, it kind of went through and they'd recommended 20,000 permits, an increase of 5,000. And all the other rack chairs said there wasn't much discussion. It was just kind of a, that was just acceptable to them. We had quite a bit of discussion about the Northeast because I, I appreciate the division. I'd asked for some numbers and 60, 60 percent of all the elk hunters, rifle and muzzleloader in the state, hunt on the Uintas in the four subunits. And 20 percent of the whole state hunters actually hunt on the South Slope Yellowstone. So as a messenger for the rack, which felt very strongly, that you didn't want an increase, I I pushed for that. And the decision that was made um, by the Wildlife Board was to go with a new quota of 17,500 tags and unlimited youth tags that will not count towards the quota. Last year, there was 1,100 or 1,125 approximately youth tags to utilize that hunt. So if you made the assumption that it was going to be similar, you're you're at about 18.5, 18.6. So uh, about a three to four thousand increase. Then the issue of the um, extending the archery any bull season 
for nine days came up. And if you remember, we had a lot of discussion about that not being a RAC agenda item. And it just came from a letter from a sportsman group. And and that that discussion came up again in the wildlife board. And you know, about how how things get voted on. The public doesn't even know that's being voted on because it wasn't in the division proposal. Yet it came through the racks. And there was a lot of discussion on that and um, how its effect on the youth hunt and much of the same discussion we had at the rack. So the, the end result of that is they passed four to two a, mo an, a motion that would increase it five days at the end instead of the nine. Um, then there was, the, based on that discussion of it's an impact on the youth hunt, um, I was kind of surprised because the youth hunt didn't have a whole lot of support. Our region likes it. And um, around the state, um, they didn't, the comments at least that came out in the wildlife board were not in strong support of the youth hunt. It's hard to draw. It's 16 to one odds and you don't build preference points. So it's frustrating apparently for some people that they never draw. And then there was a discussion about the non-resident youth tags that are included in there. And there was 50 of the 500 that were non-resident and they actually have um, seven to one or eight to one odds of drawing instead of 15 or 16 to one because of the demand. So there was a motion to ask the division to uh, review the possibility of making that a resident hunt only. And that's not going to happen, I don't believe, for this year's. Well, it may happen in the spring when we set permit numbers. It's going to be priced on the action log and see what the legalities of that are. Then there was the pronghorn recommendations went through um, without any controversy as they did in our rack. Um, the other adjustments on the Henry Mountain bison hunts that were discontinued. Um, there was support to keep the, the Desert Bighorn archery hunt somewhere at the discretion of the of the of the division. That one tag that we voted for to keep, and then the new hunt on the rock on the Rocky Mountain Bighorn on Fillmore Oak Creek was passed unanimously. Um, there was the Box Elder Pilot Mountain one that was passed unanimously, which was just a, a administrative issue with Nevada, where we trade the tag back and forth. And then the balance of the recommendations were were passed. Then the the the, um, the the wildlife board passed the the adjustments to the deer management plans with the population objective adjustments that were recommended, with the exception of one, and it's the Elk Ridge unit. And they, they did ask some questions and ask that that would not be as reduced as not be reduced as much as was recommended by the division. And I believe that's that's about it. Let's see. Oh, the other issue was the um, landowner association tags, which we discussed at length. And there was so many different situations throughout that list in all the regions that I, I could tell it was very frustrating for the wildlife board where you're saying, oh, this one deserves some tags and this one doesn't. And and they made a motion to, um, to approve all of the landowner. Let me read this. Approve the landowner association permits at the 2020 allocation level, with the exception of decreases due to the decrease in public permits on a unit, and with the exception of the landowners that qualify under the new proposal for additional permits, keeping the proportions the same. So they asked the division to try to come up with something consistent that was not 
um, that was not just subjective and just dis discussed every three years at the racks and try to make it fair across the board. So the the bottom line is the the three that we had in the in the region, the the Diamond Mountain would stay the same. The um, the one in Daggett County, the three corner, I don't remember the exact number, the three corners um, unit would stay the same. And Dax, I wasn't sure what that meant on the book cliffs where we'd reduce permits. Um, so I'm gonna, in a moment when I finish this up, I'm gonna ask you to tell us what happened on that book cliffs unit because I didn't know if it applied to that decreases in public permits. And then the CWMU um, proposal was passed unanimously. And I believe that was it. So I'm not trying to limit discussion in any way. And it was a long meeting and I may have just kind of skimmed over the, the highlights, but um, I'd open that up to um, questions from the rack. Dan, go ahead. Yeah, Brett, or, or anybody really that was there. Um, I know because that was a long meeting, but um, so Dax or anybody else from the division, if you can maybe help answer this question. My question is, um, can you help me understand what the Wildlife Board's rationale was for the decision on Anthro Mountain, the Nine Mile Anthro Mountain unit? With the, as I understand it, it's a it's gone from what it was um, and I, I'm not exactly sure. I, I, what I think it what it was was a an early season rifle limited entry elk hunt and a late season rifle limited elk hunt, and then also an archery season. But what it, what I understand it to be now is a a, a thirty day or a month long archery hunt up there on Nine Mile Anthro, followed by a six week hams hunt. Is that am I understanding that correctly? Yes. Yep, that's correct. So the so, yeah, if somebody the could maybe, before, yeah, help me understand that. Well, just I was just going to mention the way it was before. There was an archery hunt, an early rifle hunt, a muzzleloader hunt, a late rifle hunt, and there was also an option to draw a multi-season tag that would let you hunt all of those hunts. And okay. that's kind of our pretty standard structure for our current limited entry elk units. Okay. And so, and then you're correct. The new the new structure it will still be a limited entry unit. Where you'll you know uh, use limited entry bonus points, incur a five year waiting period after you draw. The permit fee is the same as the limited entry, and there's basically a month long September archery season followed by you know the beginning of October till mid November hams hunt. So, yep. Okay. Can, can somebody? Can Randy, somebody Randy's, on, Randy's on board from the wildlife board. If you'd like him to discuss the rationale. Yeah, and I understand that you know the, the the board was dealing with a proposal from the division that was quite different than what the RAC, you know, voted on. But I'm just trying to understand kind of how they, you know, what was the rationale to, for that middle ground that they decided on. Randy, would you like to address that? Uh, yeah, sorry, I was trying to get my. Uh... My fingers to work on the uh, on the keyboard there. Uh, basically, you know, there were some hand hunts uh, decide or offered on some of the other limited entry units, and um, it, we just thought as a good compromise there. We wanted additional. You know, I think that the division was was trying to get additional uh, opportunity in some of those some of those locations, and so kind of as a as a good compromise, we we said let's let's just try it on this unit and and see how it works out. I think that's the thought process. You know, uh, was it, uh, Randy, was it, well, help me, Brett. I don't recall us having that option to, it was either option to close it or open it up to everybody, you, you know, or and leave it a limited entry. Wasn't that what our proposals was? And then it goes to Salt Lake. You know, I think these stuffs are not following Atma Minutes rules. It has got to be clarified on the agendas, you know, and we never had that on our agenda. 
and I think they're in violation, especially on that one with the, that wasn't even put on the agenda for the archery deals. You know, I would, I've got, you know, if we're just throwing these out the door for everybody to run at and the guy sends in an email, uh, where does the Optima Minute violations come into this stuff? It has to be on the agenda and this hams hunt. Am I missing something? Was never presented to us on the agenda. It was either to, if I recall, now help me, it was uh, recalled to uh, this to be closing the unit. So I need to get some clarification. Maybe I don't remember that I can't open up my screen here so I can read the minutes, but bring it back up. But did we have that option? I think I think we could have came up with that idea as a recommendation. Keep in mind, we're making recommendations to the wildlife board who makes the decisions. And right. we didn't make that recommendation. I guess I guess we could have, Brad. Um, but we well, did not. I, we know, recommended we recommended leaving it as a limited entry hunt, and we voted on that unanimously. And the division's recommendation was to eliminate it as a limited entry hunt. And I don't want to speak for the wildlife board, but I was there, and they were trying to find some type of compromise. Yeah, and well, I my, believe that's what they did. Yeah, my my concerns are is. Uh, you know, I, I think we need to, uh, I'd like to see our rack out here, uh, uh, you know, motion into looking into optimum minute violations on these things. Now, maybe it's just wide open with these, but I, I, we cannot operate over here and come up with this archery deal by an email that's not officially put on an agenda. You know, and it, you know, if we're just going to throw this open and wide open and take anything and run at anything, and whatever it is, and they're going to do the same out there at the state. Uh, holy smokes, I see a train wreck coming. That'd be my concerns. Is, and But maybe you could, Miles, or somebody could clarify with the state. You know, if maybe the state does not follow by the same rules that the counties and the state governments have to, as far as, I know I go out there and sit on these other state boards, but if it's not on the agenda, you cannot make a motion to move on it and it was not presented to us on the agenda as as, as some options but i know there's some variations there but i i still question how come the state you know because the rest of us was unnotified of this and you know of it and took the input from the rest of it i understand the compromises and stuff but man i think it needs to be laid down on the table to all of us uh before the state rack makes these recommendations, you know, and, and go in there because. Hey, hey, Brad, can I jump in a minute? Yeah. You know, what, what, what it says on, on the number, number four, it says discontinued um, current limited entry hunts. And it says we recommend discontinuing the current limited entry hunt, which was the one we've got right now on the following units to either allow a new limited entry opportunity or a general season any bull unit. And th and so what we went with was a new limited entry opportunity. Okay, I, I think we're covered there, but now let's go to the archery. The guy that wasn't ever, you know, it was all just an email. Which, which, which one are you talking about? Eliminating the five days, or you know, went from nine days extended and they settled on a five day. Oh, okay. Randy, you know. Yeah. Uh, the proposal, the, the proposal had no, recommendations for an in, for extended season. The nine days came through the racks from a, I believe it was a sportsman's group that started it. And then the board voted on the five days. So that was the way it went. We, we, we had voted no extension, which also mirrored the divisions. Well, the division didn't make a recommendation because it wasn't part of the agenda. So they, they made a recommendation. There was a there was a recommendation made for all the seasons, for all the all the hunting seasons. This was the right one, and it's it's right there. I can't remember what page it's on, but it's it. There was a recommendation for that, and they were going to leave it just like it was. The board modified that. Okay, Correct. so it was clarified in the, on our agendas. I'm going to have to go back and look, but our agenda that was presented to us 
you're saying that that, and it wasn't just through the emails, but it was on the official agenda. agenda. And that's what my question is, is it has to be printed to the public on the agenda. You know, and maybe maybe it was on ours, and I'll have to just go back and clarify it. But, it, man, I tell you, this something this loose. Us as county officials sure can't get by with acting on stuff this loose. Yeah, Brad, it, it's not, it, it's, it's on the agenda. I mean, it's not a line item on the agenda unless you go to the, the actual season dates of where it says that box elder, these are the dates and, and, and general season, these are the dates. And, you know, if you go look in all those, it, it's on that one, which, which is the, um, you know, the, uh, the gen when it talks about the, the general season, because that is a general season hunt. Uh, the spike, the limited, the spike is, on a limited unit is a general season hunt, and that's where it talks about that. So, well, uh, uh, but I still just don't see it as an agenda item, you know, on there. But it's, uh, but anyway, that's just my concerns, just my thoughts. Yeah. Let me uh, just maybe jump in real quick. About the hunt? I don't want to represent the, about the archery board. hunt. Okay, Miles. Miles, you've got the floor. Go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> you know, at the board meeting, there was a couple of rack chairs brought up that same concern, Brad, um, of some items that didn't necessarily uh, were on the original proposal. Uh, and the board discussed that a bit with them. And one of the things that was discussed is, you know, if somebody the public wants to come with an input or some proposals, you know, their mechanism to do it is at the big game rack meeting. Uh, which was the one that we had here in the region. And, you know, that thereby went to the wildlife board. So, you know, there's kind of two points of view on that a little bit, but it was discussed a fair bit at the board that that was an opportunity to let people bring ideas to the table and, and have considered during the, the, the big game rack meeting. So, but uh, that's something that I can relay back and we can try to get some well, clarification on in the future. Well, you know, Miles, if you wouldn't, I'd like to ask, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, I'd like to run it up the chain a little bit there and ask him, say, is this an optimum minute violations? Because it, it, you know, and I'm just saying that we just need to get this clarified in the future. I just hate to see us get running so loosely. How do we know what to bring up and discuss on these? You know, I can see him down there in the Southern unit come up and saying, well, we'd like to, uh, open the book cliffs for general season deer tags and it's not even on our agenda and we don't talk about it. You know, I think it just needs to have some structure, a little better structure. And that's my only comment. Joe Arnold, did you have a comment? Yeah. All I was saying is I, I thought that the, they shortened the, the spike hunt, but I think the one Brad was talking about was, uh, cause that, that was part of what we threw out there was eliminating the spike cut. But I think the, the other one that was maybe just an email that I, I don't remember the agenda as well, that it was the, the one that went into the youth hunt that was not necessarily a, I guess we didn't believe it was a formal action. It was just kind of a, maybe a pipe dream to throw it out there to see, you know, what, what merit it had. And then it, it goes to the wildlife board and, and, you know, just making sure the process is right. That that's what I, I, I am agreeing with Brad that, that, that maybe that this has to go through a formal process before it goes through the process or, or, you know, if they can just throw it out to the wildlife board and we don't get a chance to necessarily vote on it. I know we did, and we had a discussion and an opinion on it, but, um, it, I, I don't know if it was a formal action on the agenda. I don't remember that. Yes, there was a three, the three season adjustments, one on the big, on the desert bighorn sheep down on the Zion, not on the Zion. Um, anyway, on this, in the Southern region, there was the adjustment of the season of the spike hunt on the book cliffs. And then there was the adjustment of the season of the general elk bow hunt. All three fall into that. They all came a different route to the to the wildlife board. So everybody's point is well taken. Um, they didn't they didn't hit the rack discussion. The 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 bow hunt extension did because we saw it coming because we saw it on the minutes of the other racks. 
And that's the only reason we saw it coming. So you're you're exactly okay. correct. Yeah, and I don't think they had the rights under the minute uh, regulations to act on that. You know, that's my concern, and I'd like it clarified. So, my, Miles, you'll look into that for Brad and, and at least relay the concern from the RAC? Yeah, I'll, I'll definitely do that, uh, and I'll try to have a report uh, back to this RAC by our next meeting. So, Okay. Thank you. Um, I, I would like I, I would like Dax to maybe answer the question where we were on such opposite pages of of what the racket as a unanimous and the division as a unanimous and and the compromise I think is right and good job Randy and his team for that you know because I think we were completely opposite sides but I, I definitely would like to see or hear from Dax on where we missed in their mind versus what you know, what, what, what we voted on. <clears throat> um, so I, maybe I can speak to that just a little bit. You know, uh, we feel a lot of sense of ownership, you know, at, at a regional level oftentimes, but we also have to remember that this is a statewide resource. And, uh, you know, there's a lot of people that put in to go hunt the book cliffs that don't necessarily live in UN or Duchesne or Daggett counties. And so, um, you know, the other four racks all voted to convert Anthro into a general season any bull unit. Our rack was the only one that did not vote to do that. So when the wildlife board, um, you know, goes through the rack motions from the different racks, you know, they're faced with, okay, well, four of the five said, make it any bull, make it general season, you know, and the, and the local rack said, no, we want to keep it limited entry. And then, you know, I can't make assumptions for why the board did what they did but i i just would point that out that it you know i think the board tries to listen to local input but it is a statewide resource and when four of the five racks voted to do one thing you know it, it makes sense that they saw that as a compromise to go with something kind of in the middle where it still will retain limited entry status and be managed for you know some kind of quality beyond what it would be as a general season any bull hunt but you know i can't make assumptions for for you know, I can't read the mind of, of the board members, but I think Randy kind of explained that that it was, it was a compromise. So I don't know if that answers your question or not, Joe. But yeah, a little <laughs> bit, Dax. I I think um, you know, just we were on completely different different you know sides of it, and and that's okay. You you guys have good information, and and we have information and and passion about you know twenty years ago when the anthro was good. And so, you know, and you guys are, you know, professionals and biologists. So you think, you know, you, you definitely have all the studies to tell you, hey, yeah, it, it, this is probably the, the best route to go. I wonder if maybe in the future, because <clears throat> if uh, and it's been brought up years ago that maybe there should be a weighted average on region voting, because there there's there's, you know, four of the five. If we voted on some place down in southern Utah, sometimes we, we it isn't in our backyard so so we don't put as much effort and passion and 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 you know education into it and i, I just you know because i i agree with you four of the five but they probably just as the board nobody's been to the anthro so it's easy to vote yeah let's just let's just open it up so i, I would hope there's some weighted average put on the the local region you know when it comes to voting thank you you know, and that's and that's saying a lot right there because uh, how many times do we go off of what the division recommends on these southern units or northern units because they're not in our backyard? And, you know, so we as a board, I know I do, but regular take off of what the division wants because I don't know anything about the Carmel unit down there and wherever it's at, but their rack. You know, but I think it looks like to me that, you know, we as board members that we probably need to, if we're feeling passionate about this stuff before it comes up, start getting a hold of the key individuals in these other racks and tell them, hey, this is in our unit. We want you to support us on this. And what do you have in your unit that you want us to support you in? Because we can't argue against the division down there. So we go along with the division and what their recommendations are for these other racks, because quite frankly, most of us probably don't even know where these units are. 
but uh, you know, this isn't, uh, you know, so I think we, it's not a, you know, we've either got to restructure it a little bit or we need to make sure that we do our homework and get start calling key members in that other rack and telling them we're not in favor of this. Would you please support us? So they at least know prior to the, you know, they go into the rack and we have a say in it instead of them just going off what the division wants. Because I know that's what we do on quite regular. Yeah, just can I, on this, Randy, let me just t tell you one thing. Um, you know, you guys voted unanimously to eliminate the spike cut in the book cliffs. Uh, there was another rack that, uh, that 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 motion mate came up and in, and it was voted on also. And I, I can't remember which way it went. Uh, I, I wrote it down. I, I haven't looked here. But, um, I mean, so some of the things that are in our backyard, is other people are pretty passionate about, too, and in, uh, in where they're at. And, and Dak's exactly right that, you know, it's, you know, this is a, a state resource and there's a lot of people from the Wasatch Front and from other parts of the state that, that love our region and they love to come out in the region and they, they understand what's going on in our region probably better than some of us do, at least better than I do. I'll put that out. Uh, so it's, it's interesting when you, when you talk and, and watch some of the other racks, they've got some Pretty knowledgeable people about what's going on in, in in other regions than their own. Thanks for um, everyone's input. Um, that was what I was referring to. That we, you know, as a as a chairperson, I could have done a better job of meeting with the division when we had that big gap uh, prior to the wildlife board, and not putting the wildlife board in that in that position. And so I'll I'll work on that. And your point about talking to the other racks. Uh, that's a valid point, Brad. So I'd like to move this on if we could. Um, Daniel, da Daniel Davis has joined us. And then if there, if I'm not trying to cut anybody off, if there's more yeah. discussion, yeah. but uh, Daniel, would you introduce yourself, please? <laughs> oh, okay. Um, we're not getting any audio from you. I'll just, I'll just tell well, the. Just, just took me a minute to get there. That was hidden okay. behind a bunch of other windows. So, okay. Daniel Davis, uh, represent the sportsman. Thank you. Um, Dan Abeda, did you have another question? Yes, I did. I'm going to circle back to Anthro Mountain. I never really kind of got my questions answered totally, um, but so I'm going to circle back now, and I think that this is the time to do it before we move on. Um, in terms of opportunity on Anthro Mountain, the uh, yeah the nine mile Anthro Mountain unit, where the direction we're going now, to, if if I'm doing my math correct and I understand this correctly, is providing 75 days in the field for hunting, 30 plus the 45. How does that compare to the previous hunt structure, Dax? Is it the same, uh, more or less? So I'd have to go back and look at the days the. The intent rather, you know, more so than giving lots of days, I think the intent is to let more people, more individuals hunt. So, you know, when we look at opportunity, often we're we're looking at it not just in terms of how many in terms of how many days they get to hunt, but how many people get to hunt. You know, every person that draws and gets to hunt, you know, is someone that burns their bonus point, incurs the waiting period, helps with, you know, issues like point creep. And uh so you know, it is a, a very long liberal season. Uh, most of the racks actually voted to shorten the season for the hams portion to just the 1st through 15th of November, but the full six week season went through in the board. But uh, so I'd have to sit down and do the math then to tell you exactly on, on days, but I know the intent is to allow more individuals to draw, to issue more permits with the, the archery and hams hunt versus the traditional limited entry elk structure like we had before. I if, I may, if I may add, Dan, there there was 30 total permits or approximately 30 prior on the anthro unit, all the hunts combined. And we don't set permit numbers till spring, but the assumption is that that would increase substantially. Is that right, Dex? So we'll we'll see. We you know uh, that the that's the intent. You know I can't speak to exact permit numbers or anything yet. We're still waiting to 
get all the data back from last year and then you know that'll come through the racking board process in the in the spring so but yes that is the intent to issue more permits with this new strategy this new unstructured strategy than we than we were before is that is that because the percent success is so much lower so it's anticipated so this is a relatively new thing um it is anticipated that uh the primitive, basically that ham hunt, you can use handgun, archery, muzzleloader, shotgun, but no optical sights allowed. So it's anticipated that folks will be less selective, perhaps less successful because they're gonna have a more limited range um, for, you know, and that that wasn't what we recommended for the anthro, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see how it works and, uh, and uh, see see what happens. All right. All right. Hey, thanks. I'm good. Randall Thacker, would you like to say something? I was just going to try to answer Dan's question. Uh, I looked at it. looks like it would be about 52 days, roughly, with the old hunt structure would have been the total between the, the four hunts, basically, that would have been involved there. So, Okay, so that's a significant increase from 52, you say, Randall? Uh, 52 might even be 53 there without looking at the calendar, see how many yeah. 31st there <laughs> oh. were and things like that, but yeah, about that. that. Yeah. That's still a pretty significant increase. You know, it's like a 50% increase to 75, right? Yeah. What was the permit numbers again? How many did we used to give on it? And what are we giving with this new hunt? So prior was 30, about 30 total, but we have not determined the new hunt yet. Till, till spring when we do numbers, I believe. So is there any discussion about holding it to the 30 tags, even though it's scattered over different units, or, or are they just going to let them sell as many tags as they want? You know, we, we voted to keep it a limited entry, so I think that means that, it, you know, I hope they kept some kind of structure in there to saying, well, it is going to be a total of 30 tags. We're going to give you another 25 days, but uh, where are we going with the tag numbers on it? Well, the tag numbers are determined that we set up the hunt structure at this meeting. And then after the winter counts and in the spring sometime, whether it's March or April, when we do the permit numbers, that will be the topic at that time, Brad. Okay. In, in, its, in its heyday, it was 10, 10, uh, 10 bull elk during the, uh, any weapon when it was the, the best it was. Okay. Um, any other topics, any other questions or comments regarding the wildlife board meeting? If not, we'll move on to the regional update. Yeah, Brad, this is Daniel. I got a quick question. Okay. When, when the wildlife board gives directive um, to the division to establish some working groups or some committees. Um, what's the process on those and, and who do they reach out to? And is it from the RAC level or is it from the private sector? Or where does those committee members usually come from? Now, I can answer some of that. I've just spent about eight weeks on the mule deer working group, uh, Daniel. You know, I was selected I'm not quite sure how it's selected, but there's quite a wide variety of people uh, that was selected. To, you know, there's probably 30 of us, 35. I don't know how come they selected me, you know, out of our rack to work on that mule deer working group. You know, it was, uh, it's uh, not a friendly, it's not a very friendly set up position. We had to be at Springville at 5.30 at night or 5, 5.30 at the Spanish Fork Springville office down there. You know, and it made it, it was a, it was quite a commitment to try to get to it for as many meetings as we had and for as late as it was, but that's as much as I know, Daniel. Miles, would you like to briefly discuss that? <clears throat> you know, I, I think if I'll let Dax kind of approach that, he's, he's worked on the health committee, so he can explain it really well. So, um, you know, I've been in, involved in a lot of those statewide committees. Um, in, uh, in state code, the division is directed to consult with uh, some specific constituencies when we write our plans. And, uh, you know, and those include uh, 
representatives from agriculture, landowners, sportsmen, uh, land management agencies. Um, we also always try to include someone from each of the five racks, as well as someone from the wildlife board and those committees. You were chosen, Brad, for the mule deer committee um, because uh, you know, you're a local elected official and also because of your ties and ownership on Diamond Mountain. That was one of the reasons that you know, the, the Salt Lake office, the folks that are in charge of the committee will consult with the regions and get recommendations from us. So thanks. So you're welcome or sorry, I guess, Brad, but uh, we did recommend to have you serve on that committee because we felt like you could represent multiple interests from, from our region. Um, so I hope you take it as a compliment and that it wasn't too much of a burden on you. But uh, that, so the process is not incredibly formal um, where, you know, the racks do the, you know, the, the division's regional personnel will make recommendations to whoever is putting the committees together. Um, and some of that, you know, they, they give us some latitude to try to choose individuals that, you know, or nominate, recommend individuals that we think will uh, do a good job representing, you know, diverse interests. Um, and then ultimately the membership of that committee, you know, uh, I think goes through a screening process in Salt Lake and then they go ahead and start making invitations. Um, sometimes some groups have a standing invitation and the groups will choose who they're going to send to represent the group on those committees. So it's not an incredibly formal process, but I think, you know, if you look at our last several, you know, big committees, you can see that there, there are, uh, you know, a lot of different constituencies and, and interest groups represented, both the ones that were directed to have uh, representation from ENCODE and, and other ones that we try to include because we want to hear from a, a diversity of voices and perspectives on those committees. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, we will move on to the next item, which is a regional update from Miles. Okay, good evening, everyone. Uh, got a few things to share with you. Um, our habitat section, they've been pretty busy lately, and they've just been finishing up a project they worked with the Forest Service on. That's the reseeding of that East Fork fire. That was a, a big fire that happened. Um, they identified with, with the forest 9,050 acres for reseeding, and these were primarily the lower elevation areas as you get into the winter range, and they were particularly areas that had some more of a south aspect. Uh, we, we learned on the Neal uh, North fire uh, from the early 2000s that when you get that south facing aspect at lower elevations, um, you tend to have cheatgrass take over those sites. And so felt pretty strongly about getting some seed on there before cheatgrass had an opportunity to, to dominate that. So um, that was 950 acres I just finished up last week. It was a combination of, of airplane and helicopter seeding. So uh, good news there. Uh, I think everything at this higher elevation should be uh, pretty well, should should uh, recover pretty well on its own over the next couple of years. So uh, we're excited to have that done. Uh, habitat folks, this is the time of year they start to plan projects for the next upcoming, upcoming year and they have to have proposals and things developed by uh, the first or second week in January. So they're, they're busy doing that as well. Uh, it's a lot of work, you know, putting partners together and, and put these projects together. It's definitely great work for our wildlife resources. Uh, in the wildlife section, just last week, uh, early this week, actually finished doing deer captures. Uh, these were deer captures on the south slope of the Uenas, some of the book cliffs, and also uh, over on the Wasatch East unit. A uh, couple reasons for these captures. Uh, one was kind of the survival study that we do on the south slope. It's where we call our cap adult does and fawns, and that's where we can really uh, get a good idea of what our actual survival rates are fawns, and that really helps us uh, be able to make better models for the populations. Then the other captures, in the, partly in the book list and partly in the Wasatch, were migration initiative, uh, just to get a better idea of where deer are migrating to. And of course, it's a continuation in the book list of our uh, survival study and, and also including uh, fawns and and, uh, and calves. So, you know, one thing that's interesting with the captures this year is our fawn weights are coming in <clears throat> fairly low this year from what we would like. 
uh, the lower those fawn weights, the lower survival. So while we do need some precipitation to get out of this drought, we our deer herd really doesn't need a, a big heavy snow winter this year. Uh, our adults will probably make it through, but we could lose fawns if we get significant. Uh, you know, what's problematic also is these does, are, when they're in lower condition, that's going to affect our, our fawn birth weights next spring. The lower the birth rate, uh, the lower survival overall. So anyhow, let's hope that uh, we get kind of the ideal conditions this winter uh, where we don't lose too many deer, and, and then hopefully we can get some good pre precipitation throughout the spring and summer to really boost those those does. So, wish we had a little bit better news on that, but um, we'll we'll just have to see how we how we make it through. There's also some pronghorn captures done in the book cliffs as a migration initiative study, uh, as well. So, busy busy time of year for for those folks. There'll be some bighorn captures around Flaming Gorge coming up in January, uh, and then there'll be additional captures in, in February and March to actually be able to implant. Uh, vaginal implant transmitters and some of the cows, elk, and doe deer in the book list for that uh, that uh, neonate survival study. So, in the aquatics world, you know, um, a lot of the lakes are starting to freeze now. If you get up above about 7,500 feet, most of those lakes are, are frozen and are fishable now. So, uh, the lower elevations uh, here in the in the basin. Uh, a lot of the lakes are starting to cap. They're probably not too safe just yet. So in the next couple of weeks, there should be better fishing happening on those. But there's a number of events uh, this year. I mentioned a couple of them last time. Um, but this ice addiction tournament is going to be held at Steinecker Reservoir this year. Uh, it'll be on January 23rd. Uh, you know, they go out and pre-drill pre a number of holes, like 900 holes. And, and so kind of the rules are the participants have to fish in one of the holes that they've drilled and they don't allow sh ice shelters and, and things like that. Um, but that's an event that's been popular. It's been at starvation in the past, but it's at, at uh, Steinker this year. The Burbot Bash in Flaming Gorge is going to be January 29th through the 31st. Um, and then the Starvation State Park, or Fred Hayes State Park at Starvation, I should say, they're having an ice bowl. That'll be on February 6th. And then, of course, there's a continuation of the uh, lake trout contest up at Buckboard Marina where they have tagged um, smaller lake trout under 25 inches. And so if you catch one of those tagged lake trout, uh, it can be worth a cash prize. And then you can be entered into uh, a prize drawing for, I think, a boat and then a couple of other things. So a lot of things coming up for ice fishing and activities this, this winter. Uh, some other news. Uh, our investigator Sean Davis, he is retiring at the end of the month, so we'll we'll miss his uh, service to the division. Appreciate his his work. Uh, he's had a great career, and uh, so we'll definitely miss him, and, and we'll hope that we can get somebody to replace him soon. Uh, in addition, uh, our director Mike Falks, he's also retir retiring at the end of the year. For those of you who may not heard, uh, he's been. A great uh, person to work for and work with, and he's, he's certainly going to be missed as well. Um, Rory Reynolds, he uh, has been a deputy director at uh, the Department of Natural Resources for the last year and a half, but formerly an assistant director at DWR. And he's going to be the interim uh, director for DWR uh, until the uh, governor elect uh, becomes established and, and decides to appoint a new director for the Division of Wildlife. So we'll Look forward for those decisions coming up in, in the first part of the year. So another thing I just wanted to mention, um, sent out an email to the RAC about uh, some openings on the Wildlife Board Selection Committee. Uh, any Anybody that can represent uh, sportsmen, non-consumptive, uh, agriculture, the same kind of uh, representatives that we have on the RAC can apply for that. Um, There'll be an 11 member panel and they meet about every two years whenever it's time to uh, uh, decide and recommend a, a new wildlife board member to, to the governor. So uh, sent that out. It's got the application link on that. So I'd appreciate uh, or encourage any participation anybody from the RAC wants to have that on that. They'll uh, be, be vital to selecting future board members. 
So I think that's all I have to share today, unless uh, there's any questions. Uh, appreciate your time and, and uh, for the rest of the meeting. Yeah, hey, hey, Miles, this is Dan. I just wanted to uh, extend a big thanks to Tory Mathis and his his efforts on that reseeding effort up there on the East Fork fire. We really appreciate all all the extra work and kind of pulling that off on the right timelines and everything. So, yeah, Boy, I, 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 yeah I, would sure echo, I would sure echo that too. That is, uh, uh, you know, staying in touch with those other commissioners over there. And boy, there needs to be a big shout out for everybody on that. That was great. I thought from what I've heard. Yeah, thank you. Yep, that's uh, definitely work needs to be done. It can have big consequences if we don't get on top of, of that and really dictate how those vegetation communities respond. Yeah, I'll let Tori know we're, we're grateful for all his uh, efforts on that, making that happen. Will do. Thank you, Miles. Um, I believe, was Sean Davis on this, on this meeting? Yeah, yeah, he is. Sean, I'd like to echo what Miles said. You put in many, many good years here in the basin, and we really appreciate what you've done. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Um, I have one question for Randall. Are you there, Randall? Yeah. Um, on the condition of the does compared to two years ago when we had the, the low body condition, are they that bad, or are they kind of in between last year and the year before, or what did you find on the on the Wait, south? This year, it's actually our lowest year. It's lower than even a couple of years ago. This this drought cycle for us this year, the way the timing of no moisture basically has really hurt us. They're they're low. Um, just for comparison, uh, the cash unit in northern Utah had similar weights, at, you know, two years ago, whatever, and they had zero survival of bonds that year. But they also got some heavy snow, so we hope we get a we we hope we get the moisture, but get it in a way that comes uh, that that doesn't hammer us too hard and really hurt those ponds. We're we need a lot of, of late spring moisture when it's warm, and and then keep raining all summer if we can all pray for that. I guess. Okay, thank you. Um, there's no other questions for Miles on the update. We'll move to the next item. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Darren, uh, the next the next um, item is the Black Bear Rule Amendments and Recommendations. And I'd like to ask Darren to just give a a brief summary, and then we can discuss the item. All right. Thank you, Brett. Um, tonight, uh, there are really just t a couple of items uh, that we're we're asking for some input and and a vote for. Um, as many of you may recall. Last year, the, the legislature passed some legislation um, that requires the division director to take certain actions when, when we detect that predators are causing uh, mule deer herds to struggle on a given unit. Um, last summer, we brought a policy revision around to the racks with the uh, Cougar recommendations. And so what we're asking tonight is a couple of changes to the Black Bear Plan that takes into account that new, those new policy directives. So we're asking for a couple of things. One is um, for, for bear units that qualify for predator management, that they be, cons they be taken out of the plan sideboards, managed as liberal hunting units, but not be figured in when we, when we do the statewide uh, consideration of, of all harvest data. Uh, the plan requires that that we look at the state as a whole and that all harvest data combined should fall within the moderate hunting uh, strategy sideboards. Uh, the other thing the plan requires is that only that no more than 25% of all bear units be in the liberal harvest strategy. So we're also uh, recommending that we uh, don't include predator management plan units in that calculation. So that's in a nutshell and it, it's kind of a, uh, it's kind of a bookkeeping thing. Uh, we just need to make sure that the plan aligns with with the legislation and the new the new law and then the uh, the policy. Thank you. Uh, questions from the rack. Are there none? Yeah, I've got one quick question. Okay. With removing those predator 
management units out of that rule for the liberal harvest, the, the no more than 20%, what would that look like if they stayed that way? If they stayed in liberal, well, it, they'd have to be under a formal predator management plan, Daniel. So uh, those plans have specific, uh, I always want to say justifications for why, why that unit uh, is in predator management for bears and uh, and they also have an end date so not a date necessarily but but parameters under which you would stop that that plan and so um, first you need to determine that bears are an issue um, an example of that might be on the book cliffs where we see relatively high um, mortality of neonate fawns to bears one of the few units in the state where we actually have that data because we have fawns and cause specific mortality. But you'd also need to dis determine whether or not that was adding to the overall fawn survival at the in the fall when you do fawn to doe ratios, or if uh, if there's some other factors like habitat that might be a concern. So that's how you'd get into a predator management plan if you determine that bears were an issue. And then we would uh, set some guidelines as to what how, what kind of conditions we'd need to see to, to back off on that. So uh, uh, liberal harvest strategy is designed to reduce the, the bear population 10 to 20% over three years. And so that's why we just chose to move them into that category. Did that answer your question, Daniel, or did I sort of dance around it? Yeah, not so much. And I'm, I may not be <laughs> specific. So the question, uh, and let me try to reiterate it a little bit better. The recommendation is to amend the rule that those predator management units that land there by, by statute um, don't count towards that percentage of objective for the liberal harvest. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So if if those weren't removed and they stayed in there, would we be over the 20 percent? Would we be at the 20 percent? I'm, I'm just trying to wonder why, oh, yeah. we, why, why would we remove that if that's already in place targeting the neonates, you know, in the, the areas of issue because it's defined in HB 125. Right. So why why would we need to implement that rule across the rest of the state right now? Uh... If you take all the bear units into account, we're we're right about there. We've got about twenty five percent of our units in that are already in a liberal harvest strategy. Um, and so, if you added one or two units, it would kick it above twenty five percent. We're just saying that predator management units wouldn't wouldn't count. And then we'd consider all the other units separately under the plan. So. Um, you, we may have to do some readjustment to the units that aren't under predator management to make sure we're complying with the plan, but um, but we need a way to to make sure that we. I guess the reality is, that if you need to put a plan in in a liberal harvest strategy outside of uh, outside of what the plan dictates, you need to have have some safety valve or some way in the plan that 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 tells you how to how to handle the other units. So that was the way we. We went with it. So there's a there's pretty much a potential that the state could end up with 50% of its units in liberal management. I'd have to do the math, but right now, um, I think there's well, with, seven with, there's seven units, Daniel, right now that they have high bear densities and that aren't under a uh, aren't currently in liberal harvest strategy. So those would be the units we'd probably be looking at. Um, I'm not saying those units will be pulled into predator management. In fact, most of those probably wouldn't. So it's, we're not talking about a lot of units, um, but those would be the ones that, that we might look at if we had concerns about the deer population on them and, and could determine that bears were an issue. So, um, so yeah, it, could, it probably won't wind up being 50% of the units, but, um, but it could be more than the current number. Um, this is Rebecca Jones. I was wondering if you're planning on collecting any more data to see if bears are actually preventing mule deer from reaching population objectives. Yeah, so um, we aren't going to 
we aren't planning at the moment to do any kind of specific studies. The book list right now is the one that has the neonate data um, that, that, that's definitive as far as we don't see a lot of bear mortality in fawns that are older than six months uh, on the, the units where we have bears and deer. And we don't see a lot of adult mortality to bears either. And so it, it seems like um, if bears were going to be a, an impact, it would probably be to those neonate fawns where they key in on them in the spring. Um, so on a unit where you didn't have cause-specific mortality for your neonates, uh, you, you'd probably want to look at your fawn to doe ratios in the fall and determine whether or not those are unusually low. And you could average the unit over 10 years or something like that to look at that. The other thing you'd want to look at is what, what's the body condition of your adults? That should give you some indication about habitat and whether or not the population is at carrying capacity. Typically, if uh, the, the further below the carrying capacity of the unit the herd is, the more likely a, predator, a predation issue can, can actually suppress that population. The closer you get to the carrying capacity of the habitat, um, that predation becomes compensatory. It just If you kill the predators, um, the animals die of something else because the habitat is limiting. So we've asked our district biologists who know the units the best to really inform us on, you know, to look at the data, look at their units, and, and if they feel like they need a predator management plan um, to, to put all that into, into the plan, explain why they're doing it. So does that help, Rebecca? Yes, it does. Okay, great, thanks. Okay, um, there's no more questions. Um, are there any uh, comments from the rack? I've got maybe one more question. Okay, go ahead. With the potential for the neonate harvest from the bears, has there been any consideration from the division's perspective of allowing a limited predator pursuit during that time frame? To uh, I know, I know Daniel and and the undergrad students with BYU have been collecting DNA from a lot of these kill sites. Um, haven't seen any information on that quite yet because it's relatively um, new this year for the DNA collection. Um, so if anybody has any information, that'd be great to hear. But would that is that considerable for any type of deterrent or disbursement that could take place that would help aid in some of that? Um, I know the DNA reasoning is is to make you know to see if it's it's one one animal that's found its food source and it and that's its primary food source and so it can have a, a huge substantial tool in reducing the numbers there but if if that disbursement tool that we have in the state is utilized is that a benefit that the division seen or, or considered I wish I knew more about the objectives of that study, Daniel. I don't know if they're trying to identify individual animals. I, I suspect they're probably just trying to identify species. So um, I'm not sure what's possible there. But I, I think what you're asking is, you know, if it's just one bear that's good at that, that, that specializes, um, maybe not doing a general uh, hunt, but, but maybe trying to address some specific animals would be better. Is that kind of where you, what you're thinking? Yes, because I mean they're they're very habitual animals, just like a human yeah. being. And when they find that that readily available food source, they they stay there and they stay adamant about it. And yeah. and sows with cubs and and you know females with kittens. I mean that's easy easy prey source is is the easiest way to raise their young. So you know with the ability of being able to disperse those in a pursuit method um and and apply a little bit of pressure on that summer range uh it's it, it to me it seems as a tool that could be utilized that, that possibly isn't and could have a huge impact it's something we could discuss i think i mean something that comes to mind immediately is that you know if you're if you put a lot of dogs on the ground that time of year you may actually have problems with with dogs finding fawns um but um so 
I see so what you're saying. Actually, Maybe there's some other non-lethal way to disperse bears during that time of year. That we could certainly look at that. So the the fawning that's taken place and, and the coloring that's been done out there, we've had fawns on the ground in, in that area in the springtime during the spring bear season, uh, when you when you actually have the highest number of, of dogs and, and houndsmen on the landscape. And not once have they found or seen any any conflict with the hounds because them them fawns are hitting the ground prior to the end of the season and just to be honest with you, that that end of the season is the most desired portion of the season for houndsmen. Uh, it's a holiday week, and that's that's the time that everybody takes the vacation. So, to me, I see I see no evidence, you know, to support that, you know, they're the conflict. And especially if it was a limited number, the the focus can be directed to that portion of the you know the summer range and and those habitat areas. So that uh, put a lot of thought into it. it it you know not a reckless question or comment but but a very yeah. serious one no i i think we'd you know i guess i was thinking we'd want you know you'd want to extend you know the fawns are i think pink peak fawning and dax or or clint jump in but i think peak fawning statewide is usually about mid-june the 15th i don't know if the book list is different a little bit but um that's i think what we'd want to avoid having a lot of dogs when when most of those fawns are hitting the ground so typically we've shut off so if you're just talking about the traditional hound season um then then i'd be less concerned than if we extended it to try to cover fawning season so but um but no. yeah it's certainly something we could we could discuss and we're open to ideas anything that would help to uh to mitigate that okay thank you uh miles what was the public comment on this subject Yes, there was only three people from the region uh, that commented. You know, one was opposed, uh, two were supportive of the division's recommendation. So, uh, you know, one of the comments said that they've been seeing more bears than ever. Uh, the other comment said is all the bears are disappearing. So you got kind of both sides of the spectrum there. Okay. Um... Is there any more discussion from the, the rack or any comments before we move? I just, I just want to share a little bit of concern. Brad, did you have a comment? With, no, I'm good. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about that. Daniel? I just want to share a little bit of concern about the question I had on the removing the predator management units from the liberal um, classification um which opens the door to a potential of 50 percent of the units being managed in liberal harvest um whether that percentage was reduced outside of the predator management but hb 125 actually you know it, it's got some implications there that that allows the state to to deviate from that and if it's a unit that's that's really hurt then you know those tools are readily available and and the division's been direct attacked accordingly. So I have concerns about the state possibly being managed up to 50% in the liberal. Darren, um, were, the, were the legislation keys on herd objective and, and herd size being under herd objective? You don't, you weren't given a lot of latitude on this by the legislation, were you? There, there are two things. One, like you said, Brett, the, the first thing is if the herd is below objective, then the director is is by law required to act. But the other part of that is that the, the division needs to determine that uh, that a predator or a suite of predators are causing that um, that decline. And so that's what we look. That's um, we we revised the policy to try to address that. And um, some, on some units in the state, it, it's kind of like a death by a thousand cuts. It's not one predator in particular, but it, it could be, you know, coyotes and lions and bears combined. And so, you know, we've got some really good data on our, on our mule bid herds with these collaring efforts. And we feel like we're in a really good place to, to make those determinations. But a lot of it's 
key in on on where we are with with uh, with those herd objectives. We just um, rewrote and reconsidered all of those those management plan objectives for for deer uh, that passed at the last board meeting. So that effort uh, was to try to make sure that we had realistic estimates of what those those units could support. So. Um, so we've done that too in the background. So all of that kind of meshes together uh, when we make decisions. And then we'll be reviewing predator management uh, in December this time of year as we're seeing what kind of condition those animals are in and what the fawn to doe ratios are. And then again in the summer after we've had our winter and we know what happened uh, at the end of the winter. So if we've had severe losses, uh, we may recommend some some predator efforts then but um but it depends you know it's not an all or nothing on the on predators it it may it, it's made to target the ones that that biologists feel like might be an issue and if if a proposed unit if a unit is proposed to go to predator management would that hit the rack cycle no that that'd be done uh as a direct action so we'll report it um but we won't it won't go around for a vote or it'll be part of the public process. That's something the director is, is directed to do in the statute. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I guess we are at a point where I would entertain a, a motion on the, on the division's proposal on Black Bear amendments. This is Natasha. I would like to make um, a motion to accept the proposal as presented for the black bear. This is Brad Horrocks, not second that motion. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Uh, I'll do a roll call. Brad? Yes. Joe? Yes. Dana Beta? Yes. Natasha? Yes. Rebecca? Uh, you're on mute. Yeah, sorry. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Daniel Davis. No. Okay. Um, motion passes five one. Um, and I believe that's the the end of our agenda tonight. Um, anybody have anything else they want to bring up? Uh, yeah, Brett. Brett, hey, this is Dan Abeda, and I, I do have just one more question, kind of circling back to that that Anthro Mountain uh, direction on on something like that. That's uh, th this new direction that's quite different than the the old management direction for limited entry. Is, is that something the division would give? Like Dax, how many years would the division give that a chance to, be, you know, before you this this is working, this is not working? I mean, is is this something you guys just say? Is it a one a year to year basis to give it three years, five years? What what do you do? So you know the recommendation for bucks bull once in a lifetime, season dates, hunting strategies, you know boundaries that will come around to the racking board process every year. Um, I would guess, and I can't remember exactly, but it seems like some of the language in the board meeting. Um, uh, directed us to we've got two years left on on our statewide elk plan um, these changes were recommended as part of a mid plan review by the elk committee at the direction of the wildlife board and so you know i would guess at least a couple of years and then uh, when it's time to revise the statewide plan again if if it's you know we'd have a couple of years worth of data if it looks like it's a great success you know, they probably recommend keeping it. If it looks like it's not working well, you know, they'd recommend making a change. So it will come around every year, but I'm guessing we'll go a couple of years. And then when the statewide elk plan gets revised, they'll take a really hard look at a couple of years worth the data. And, and uh, that's my, that's my guess. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Brett. Yes, go ahead, Brad. Brad Horrocks. I uh, just wanted to make comments on, uh, uh, the you know the book cliff seat bridge road the extension going on down to grand county we have uh uh tabled that you know with the 
the way the economy is and different things and the objections and whatever. Don't want to get into any details, but that has been tabled that uh, uh, pushing forward with trying to extend that road on down to Grand County, you know, for the, you know, right now it's just really not feasible to do or get support to do. So just for information for, you know, I know that's a lot of wildlife country through there, but uh, you know, the county has withdrawn that started six, eight years ago, maybe I don't know how many years ago, but anyway, it has been uh, determined to just go ahead and table that. We're looking at uh, some, you know, people have been coming to us with some ideas on that road out there. We've got uh, kind of a proposal there to making one of those lanes into a bike lane, you know, and uh, there's some things that are being proposed to maybe get some more utilization out of that road out there. But uh, anyway, just for information. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak before we have a motion to adjourn? Okay, I will uh, entertain a motion to adjourn. I make the motion to adjourn. Thank you, Brad. Uh, do we have a second? I'll second that, Dan Abeda. Thank you. Brad? Yes. Joe? Yes. Dan Abeda? Yes. Natasha? Yes. Rebecca? Yes. Daniel? Yes. Thank you. This, thanks for your attendance and everybody's input. I appreciate, appreciate everybody. Have a good evening. This meeting is now adjourned.